Daryl Branscombe and Ken McGeorge are part of a group called Coalition of Concerned Citizens. They came together because 2018 is an election year in New Brunswick, and the coalition would like to see a change, a real change, a concrete change. So Ken and Daryl share with us a lot of their ideas about how politics can change, where solutions are for health care and the economy, the debt, the deficit, and how maybe we need a new process for how all the pieces come back together. Hope you enjoy the conversation. And as a side note, the garage is the studio for the Dennis Report, and it's heated by a wood stove. And in the background, you might hear a pinging sound as the wood stove was cooling down. So I hope you just let that add to the ambience of the whole conversation. Daryl and Ken take us into the deep end, provide solutions, and really show their passion for the province. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here. Pleasure. Pleasure. The area we're going to walk into is important, powerful, and timely. Um, provincial election coming, major concerns, as well as uh, the way we've always done it maybe needs to change a little bit. So where would you like to lead us off? Well, I guess we could start with just where we where we were formed and how it all came about. And I guess the genesis of our formation was at the golf course uh, after the games with a bunch of guys, uh, most retired, and, and a cross-section of people. Uh, you know, we had doctors and lawyers and medical people and things and other professionals and just ordinary people. And, uh, you know, reading newspapers, talking about issues and say, you know, this is bad, this is not getting worse. And so then we say, can we do anything about it? And and that's when it started. And so we decided to meet and and, uh, and talk further about it. And then we drew in some other people, Richard uh, Salant and his book, Over the Cliff. And we read that and, and realized just uh, the more you delve into it, the more we realized just how serious the situation is. And so we decided that... Uh, for me, you know, it, it's a, I, my life has gone from I've had a business failure and marriage failure to success to significance. And I think Ken would be the same way, is that we're at the significant stages of our lives that we want to give back. We want to help. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, I, and as you know, I've been in the health field for over 50 years. And, and uh, part of that here in New Brunswick, a lot of it in two other provinces and uh, I was schooled very early by leaders in the healthcare professions, D Dick Goldblum for instance in, at Dalhousie and Larry Wilson at Queens, schooled in what does it take to create and maintain service excellence. Dick Goldblum at IWK would hear no arguments that didn't have at the underpinning a focus on excellence in child care. He taught me that when I was a young guy, 26 years of age working there. Never forgotten that. It's been with me all these days. So I come here to my home province, which I love and adore, and I played a role in the restructuring of health care in 1992 and poured my heart and soul into it. And to watch health and long-term care uh, struggle as it has struggled for the last 20 years to me is is unforgivable uh, it's a big disappointment and so when Daryl called and said we want a creative movement here we want to get the public in, better informed I said count me in because uh, the real issues in my opinion never see the light of day do you have a top five list for the coming election, what you see as the priorities that need to be addressed by the coalition? Well, certainly the debt is one of them, and uh, people of all you know, walks of life have been talking about the debt, the media and, and, and general public know, and we're, we're, we're paying like $1.8 million a day, uh, and, and that's horrific, you know, and, and so if, if we had that money, you think what we could do with it. So, you know, there's, there's that. And, and the top priority, you know, would be the health and long-term care services. Uh, 
and Ken can talk on that because that's his expertise, but also education. Uh, we, we just seem to be dropping the ball. We're not producing. For the amount of money we're spending on education, we're not getting any results. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're cranking out children that aren't able to compete on a national, international scale. The school population is declining. The costs are, are rising. Uh, and so those are the three. The, the duplication of services is just unbelievable in this small province. And and so you have, you know, we, we got fire trucks here and there, and we got municipalities and in, 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 in the secondary markets, and they have their own councils and things. So John K. Finn wrote a report called the Finn Report, mm -hmm. and he, he, he believes that we could downsize from 270 LSDs to 50, 50 some, mm -hmm. and and then then of course you look at the economic development. Uh, so if I were to identify five, that would be the top five, unless Ken yeah. would, you yeah. know, uh, think of others. And there are others. We've actually in our in our website have identified nine issues. Yeah, yeah. and we'll put a link to the website up sure. on, on the show, yeah. of course. Um, can we pick one and dive into it? For the sake of giving a concrete example, because the hunch would be behind it, it's going to really tie to human behavior. We've done things a certain way for 30 or 40 years. Yes. It's pretty clear that the challenge in front of us is we need to do things a slightly different way. Yes. The instinct is to tinker around <coughs> the edges and that, to foreshadow it, that might be the kind of messages we get from the politicians for the next six or seven months. Tinker with this tax base, tinker with this delivery program strategy. And maybe we don't get right to the root or the heart of it. And when you mentioned the amalgamation one, I remember when uh, that study was done, it was around 2008, 2009, I think Lise Ouellette was one of the co-chairs of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she came and met a group we had uh, privately, 30 or 40, and was talking about the process, she was flustered by um, the lack of cooperation based on the fear of losing identity. And it showed up four or five years later when Sussex and Sussex Corner couldn't come together to figure out how to be one entity of some sort. And uh, commentaries from the past would be, how does a province of 750,000 people support 350 local governance structures? It, it doesn't make sense. But to get it down to the people, though, they're so afraid of letting go of the way it's always been done. Thoughts on that dynamic and the details? Well, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. And it's one of our jobs is to go out in, into the highways and byways of New Brunswick and talk to the people and say, look, this isn't working. We, everybody in New Brunswick is a stakeholder. There's an interest in making things different, making things happen. And what we hope to achieve is, is this, is to convince everybody that there has to be a bit of sacrifice on their part in order to achieve a common goal. And that common goal is to have some fiscal sustainability uh, in the province and to grow the province and, and, and be you know, progressive in our thinking. Uh, what uh, the, the problem with, with uh, decision making uh, has been in the past, it's been uh, made for political reasons very often. Maybe, you know, I mean, so what we're saying is simply that there has to be decisions made on evidence-based information. And the evidence-based information is somewhat different than, than the other reasons. And if, if we were had a, a wish list of what we want to do would be to put a collaborative effort together with the politicians or the leaders of the political parties in order to come together with them. And nobody has an agenda. And they would agree on certain principles of operations. And we're putting, we're working and putting these principles together now. And so that that would then start the whole process. And if we can convince the public to buy into it. And by the way, if they would, short term, what we're, we're saying is short term pain for long time term gain. Yeah. We believe that we can make this problems better, but there's got to be sacrifices on everybody's part. And we want everybody to get involved and be motivated to make make it happen. Yeah. It sounds a lot like our conversation <clears throat> we had previously sure. on leadership within healthcare and what happens when political interference gets in the way of a system and a system yeah. needing 20 years to mature, not a four year election cycle. Sure, exactly. And, and certainly in the in the field that I know and love the best health and long term care. That's a huge, huge issue. It's been wanting for leadership for so long uh, in other fields that I have a more a consumer interest in, like the education field, same thing. The, the stuff you read in the paper 
when the debates happen, the political debates, don't seem to have an awful lot to do with uh, creating a better education system. They're political tinkering, they're doing things to score political points. Um, my, my, two, my grandkids just moved this year to the state of Georgia and they had to write qualifying exams um, to get into the school system there and they all per performed, they, two of them performed two grades less than where they were here. Like the 10th grade guy um, tested at a grade 8 level in the state of Georgia and I'm saying what's wrong with this picture? Well, what's wrong with the picture is they don't spend much time in the classroom to begin, it, to begin with here with all the free days off. Anyway, that's that's a yeah. whole different rant. But but to support you with that, and interesting how nothing changes, and the intent of this conversation is we need to create change. So we got to get through mitigating those risks and having a direction that will encourage us to have that change. Yeah. So an interview or a conversation with Doug Motti, who was then the executive director of Enterprise Fredericton, is 2004. And Doug, um, what's your biggest challenge to bring in business to Fredericton? And without a pause, he has, has, without a hesitation, he goes education. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And why? Because to move companies, small companies, medium companies, to our culture and our way, we can't encourage the families because there's a difference in levels when the, the kids come from one system to another. But try to bring up that as a conversation that we're not performing to our level and there's a defensiveness, there's oh. a reason about budgets and, yeah, and and yet we have so much more than most other cultures have. Yep. Yep. But there are signs uh, within education uh, that things might be changing. Uh, I've, I've been sort of invited to a couple of sessions with the ADM and people and uh, and I'm somewhat encouraged uh, that we, 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 we might just be a tad uh, on, on, the, on the cusp of, of moving. Uh, we, we're also talking to Doug Williams, and he is Learning Bar, and Doug has agreed to sort of, he's so busy, he's all over the world traveling, and, uh, but he's, he's agreed to help. Uh, and so you get people like he, and if there is an openness within the Department of Education, then, and people that are really concerned, uh, put them together, uh, and maybe we can start. No, no question. Big, big problem. Yeah. And there was a literacy gathering two years ago, funded by McCain Foundation, hosted mm -hmm. by UNB in St. Thomas. Um, there was about 100 people in the room for a full day. The main dynamic in the room that day was people got to meet each other. You had service providers, you had ed educators, you had administrators, you had civil servants, you had volunteer sector. Um, and they had never talked to each other before no. with the notion of a shared goal. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, exactly. And certainly in the in the field that I know and love um, and have spent all my life in, um, and I'm still somewhat involved in it, um, this whole health and long-term care, we can do, we could do, we must do so much better than we're currently doing. Um, we can respond to the budgetary challenge, I believe. We, there's lots of money in the system. It isn't for want of a shortage of resources in the health and long-term care arena. Um, when you look at the numbers, we have more doctors per capita than other provinces, more nurses per capita. Yet, on the other hand, we have staffing crises and we have access issues and we have... So what's wrong with that picture? Well, what's wrong with the picture is leadership. I'm sorry if that offends some uh, viewers, but it's all about leadership. And the leaders in the system, if they can't do it, they should get out of the way. And um, <clears throat> I, th I think in Ontario many years ago, not that Ontario was a model of hmm. everything by any means, but I did spend almost 25 years there. Yeah. And the government there was faced with many of the same issues. This is go going back 20 years now. With And the, the issues there were huge billion dollar issues in capital requirements to replace and refurbish major facilities and so on. What they did, the, the government intelligently understood that the politics of that was way beyond them. If they, as a government, just dealt with that through normal governmental processes, 
um, you get so much pushback from so many, because in, in health alone, there are over 2,000 vested interest groups just in New Brunswick, all, push, all at the trough looking for their mm -hmm. slice of the pie and putting on pressure uh, on, on the political process. So they established the Healthcare Restructuring Commission, which is arm's length from government, headed by people who in Ontario were big names, uh, they were head-turning names, people that everybody respected, uh, led by Dr. Duncan Sinclair, who was the then Dean of uh, Medicine at Queen's. And for about two or three years, these this commission met and they created a plan for the orderly redevelopment of uh, these huge facilities. For, so throughout all that process, government could say, well, we have this group of um, not just expert people, but hugely respected people. And um, they were happy with that. The system was happy with that. So people were able to let go of the old way of doing things and adopt a new way? Well, they, they felt that they had a neutral, arm's length, evidence-based forum where they, they weren't just arguing with um, people with other political agenda or motivations or whatever have you. Okay. And, and the whole system was, in fact, highly evidence-based as opposed to necessarily... I mean, you can't... I'm not naive and I wasn't born yesterday, so you can't eliminate political pressures from anything. Yeah particularly in New Brunswick. And besides, you know, we have no choice. I mean, <laughs> you know, right now the, the, the health and social service uh, long-term care is 4.3 billion, almost 50% of the budget. And if, if we don't change, it could, it could rise to 7 billion, yep. which would be 80% of the budget. And the, the other worry that I have is the transfer payments. New Brunswick is only generating 60 cents on the dollar <coughs> in terms of the budget. 40%, either direct or indirect, money comes from Ottawa. And with a, with a declining population, the, it's complicated, the ratios, mm -hmm. but we could very well see a decline in transfer payments, which compounds the, you know, and, and, and if the federal government, uh, you know, gets into a squeeze uh, and they, they, they look like they may be going that way, then the transfer payments could automatically uh, start. They could download the cost to the provinces, and and so that that would affect us even more. So, it, it, we have no choice but to make changes. I mean, otherwise, and the only way uh, that you can get money because we're taxed to death. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I can't see any more taxes, but there's only two sources of income: is taxation and and um, and transfer payments and uh, or borrowing, and and. Uh, and the borrowing will will cost more. Yep. So it's not. This is very interesting to wander into how complex it all is. Because the second we walk in one door, we quickly connect to five other doors. But that's the way it is. Yes. And, and up to this point in time, there's an instinct or a behavior pattern of it being a project mindset. And we're probably going to see that towards the election is we'll throw money at it with this project, throw money with that project. So the process itself needs to change. And you have both spoken to maybe a, a different process to get us there. And then with the process will come, do we have the courage to let go of old ways of doing things? Um, I want Because I want to beat on that drum for a bit because I think of amalgamation. And you talked about uh, all those political pressures from 2,000 you know, entities pushing. Everyone's there to represent. Who's there taking care of the whole? Yes. You know, so we have to let go of, I'm here to protect Bathurst or the North Shore. I'm here to protect St. John or the Funday Coast. I'm here, mm, 750,000 some odd people, geographically about this size. People will talk about one degree of separation and how we know each other. But when we show up to represent, the whole structure wants to kind of fall apart at the edges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, can you speak into that space, whether it's through health or budgets? Well, or you know, the the issue is simply uh, <coughs> distinguish it between our wants and our needs, and, and and the leadership has to come from the top. The leadership has to come from the premier. He's in power. He should provide the leadership, hmm. and and right now he should have province first. That's the issue. So we can't afford during this election period to have promises or projects when we can't afford it. Yep. And, and I'm, a, I'm aghast at, at, at what I'm hearing. And, and, 
And so, yes, we only have so many dollars. Like the people, the, the people that have our welfare or they have no income to speak of, they got to make a decision whether they could pay the rent, pay the power, you know. And so province, for some reason, has, has thinks that they can spend forever, and they can't. Mm -hmm. There's no money. Well, but, one of the storylines from this particular mandate um, was raising the HST. Yes. And then where's where's the money gone, yeah. which is projects rather than paying things down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that get into a little bit of um, there's a certain group of people who are elected, and then there's a slightly different group of people who are actually in power? You know what I mean? The backroom people, the influencers. Are, oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is that one of our dysfunctional spaces? Yes, yeah, absolutely. yes no question, yes. And now I think there's a political there's a political uh, interference with with the people in the back, and so you know you, you, which which has probably been the case for a long time. But um, so we're not privy to a lot of you know, stuff that's going on in government. I mean, we are meeting, for instance, tomorrow morning with Kathy Rogers, which is a good sign, mm -hmm. and uh, she's a good person and uh, intends you know to do the right thing or wants to do the right thing. Um, but, you know, she's under pressure and there's all kinds of political pressures with election year coming. So, you know, but our group, you know, our group is independent and we hope to, we're not looking for more members, but we're looking for people that can contribute either in time or talent or, or, or tithing or sponsors or something because we have, we have bills to pay, but we try to keep the overhead down to a minimum. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we are clear thinking and, uh, and, uh, and, and have a focus and have a direction and, and would like to be able to, whether we can or not. And we need to invite the politicians to help with that, is create the vision. Without the vision, the people are lost. Yep. We want to create a vision. And that's a, that's a uh, macro vision. Yep. And, and we have a tendency, uh, like I almost got drawn into issues last week, you know, and because some things are so abundantly clear that you need to change, but we we're trying to stay at thirty thousand feet, <laughs> and then say fly over, look down on it, and say okay, how we can how can you manage this 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 province better, and if we could stay at that thirty thousand and come up with principles of operation and things like this. I think we can, and if, if the politicians will agree. Now, we've met with leaders of the, polit of the parties, except for the premier and one other leader of a party, but the other three or four that we have met, you know, are very cooperative and want to achieve the same type of uh, goals that we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, uh, there's good signs. So This whole health and long-term care uh, piece, for instance, uh, to your earlier question, we... It's 50% of the budget, and if experts in the field, and I don't consider myself an expert, I'm an experienced old codger, but not... You might be expert. an elder in the field. I'm an elder in the field, um, would tell you that if you resolve, if you get a good handle and strategy on aging care, that now you've cured about 50% of the health system. And so that's why I get so excited about, about this. When I got involved with the Aging Council and we created this Aging Council strategy. Through that process, however, it became evident to me that um, <clears throat> the politicians struggle to get really good, clear uh, direction. Um, it became clear that um, there's a very strong, powerful civil service, which I knew I used to be part of that many years ago. Somehow, somehow in all of that in New Brunswick, um, there seems to be a, a missing link. The political folks would like to see change, but then the price for the change that they dream of is huge, not not in monetary terms but in terms of they gotta put the shoulder to the wheel and and uh, and really become the boss and call a tune and and um and you have a very strong public service that doesn't necessarily i mean with with this plan when we were uh putting it together there are certain very key issues issues that are critical to the man on the street that we scarcely got at and 
couldn't get at in the level of detail that I really felt was critical. Mm -hmm. um, and those issues still have not been resolved. Now, this was tabled in January um, 2017. Some of the hot button issues in here could have been fixed by now to the, to the satisfaction of the public, but not. One of the issues that we talked about in this document was rural health strategy. Mm -hmm. And didn't flesh it out, but <clears throat> that's a big deal to me because in this rural province where the rural population is declining, but they, when we started health care reform in 1992, the plan was ignored <clears throat> later, later on by starting with the Lord government and beyond. And some of us have been talking since way back in 93 and 4 about we need to create a proper rural health strategy that would deal with a whole lot of stuff that you see repeatedly in the in the news. Mm -hmm. A rural health strategy has never been figured out in this rural province. Yet we set about in 1992 to become a national leader. Well, come on. We can't develop a rural health strategy in this rural province. What's wrong with us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which gets to, because you provided a solution and still it got stuck somehow or it didn't turn into an action. So, and we're on that cusp for the next 20 years. So things have to become an action. We've got enough studies done. Oh, um, oh yeah. Studies you know, galore. Yeah, because it doesn't turn into an action in that buying time to get to a third year of a mandate to then roll out money and... Sure. So those habitual behaviors will mm -hmm. be interesting. Part of what can allow that to change is something that's exciting and that you know it's going to work. If, so people have to be emotionally engaged for the change to occur. Intellectually engaged to deal with the evidence-based part, but then to get down to it somewhere in their bones and no, we really need to do this. Um, so how do we shift this conversation or dance between the intellectual plane and the elements that we need to do through evidence-based uh, structures, um, good theory, good research, to people want to do it? They, they, for instance, to reduce health care costs, well, people just took care of themselves a bit more. My interview with John McGarry uh, two years ago, he can reduce health care costs by a certain percentage if people just had a better diet. The better diet would go back to accessing local foods and, and groceries, which then have an impact on your local economy. It's as if we're that close to the pieces, but it needs a catalytic moment or a, a, a shift in a paradigm that goes, boom, this is how we do it. And, and I guess uh, one of the, it, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So it is right. I mean, it, you, you got to start looking after yourself. And we can't stop running to the doctor and for every little thing and stop backing up the emergencies and things like this. You know, I mean, years ago in my day, you know, there were a lot of homespun <laughs> remedies for things that, that still could be incorporated. And they worked. <laughs> and they worked to incorporate. But above all, you know, if we say to people, yes, you've got to change, you've got to try to help us, but at the end of the day, we're going to be better off. Hmm. We're going to have, uh, you know, centers of excellence. Like some of the rural hospitals could be repurposes for the nursing home that, that, that's needed. And so what we're, trying, what we're going to try to do and say to people, look, if you help us, you'll be better off hmm. and, and ultimately get them to buy into it. The problem is, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, and a lot of New Brunswickers are concerned with just having enough cash to yep. meet their day, day to day uh, needs, and and we know that. And so, you're not going to change that. But if you provide the leadership and the vision, hmm. and get people motivated, it's got to be almost like a evangelical movement of sorts. Yeah, it's emotional. Emotional, yeah. and, and and try to you know, and so we need help in getting partners to help us help people and people helping people. That's what it's all about. And to those who share our vision, they can help. And that, because all kinds of people will ask, what can we do? And that's what they can do. You know, we, we got to start this movement where, where people start looking after themselves better and be by, part of a bigger picture. And, and, and this is simple things like we talk about exercise and diet and stuff like this. Uh, and and sort of taking responsibility, uh, 
you know, this isn't a free lunch, you know. We're Can we turn back to the financial management of the province a little bit in deficit and debt? Because that's one of the constant narratives through an election year. Um, so here's a query just to play with. It's 19, it's 2009. The liberals of the day were rolling out their budget. The media were portraying it as the record deficit for New Brunswick. It was about 749 million, somewhere in there was forecast. Victor Boudreau was the finance minister at the time. A reporter did a little bit of research and dug back and found, um, when talking to the Auditor General from 1999-2000, that in fact New Brunswick's record deficit would have been then, when Bernie Lord's government took the tolls off the highway, and it would have been something like $890 million. But they called it a special item and they put it over here and they did that dance that makes people not trust <laughs> what they're being told. Um, Yep. What I find fascinating when tracking debt deficit, mainly deficit, over a 10-year period, we're now talking roughly $200, $300 million range, assuming we trust you know, what we're being presented. So a question sort of emerges. So how does a little province with no change in its GDP, with no change in population other than decline, no real change in economic growth, it's kind of been flatlined, how is it that that deficit shrinks so much during that window of time. And why doesn't media cover that as a good story? Because you would think going from 800s, millions, down to 200 millions in a 10-year window would be a good thing. Well, or is it all smoke and mirrors, yeah. and we shouldn't trust it at all and come up with a different way of talking about it? And I'm not sure the media is right. Uh, the, you, 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 you must distinguish between operating deficits and funded deficits. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're overall we're we're around fourteen billion dollars overall, and and so uh, is that debt or deficit? That's the total debt. That's total, the total debt. debt. Yeah. Okay. That's the total debt. And if you add the funded debt to that, we're at twenty twenty billion dollars. Okay. Okay. That's the funded debt, and the government is responsible for MB Power, which is four point <laughs> four. Yeah. So let's say for discussion purposes, we are twenty twenty five billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And so the interest on that is $780 million a year. And so even though <coughs> it looks as if we're shrinking the deficit, we're not. We're moving it over into the funded part. And so you're looking at building the roads and things like this. That goes into funded debt. That's a capital. And so in some, we still have to pay debt is debt. And so we still have to pay the interest. Yep. So even a 1% point in interest rate hikes could be stupendous because we're looking at $20 billion. And so, you know, you don't have to do be a rocket scientist to figure out 1% of that. And so it's a bit misleading. And, 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 and so that's what I'm saying. And you can't, there's no, there's no, and you say there's no other sources. I mean, I am disappointed because I, I thought when the HST was going on, like most of the Brunswickers, that we were going to balance the books. Instead of writing off 200 and some million dollars, we increased to 300 million dollars. Mm. And to me, that's not playing fair. Well, and, and the silver lining here, however, is that <clears throat> you remember in 1990, 91, that window, <clears throat> the um, bond rating agencies were raising flags about New Brunswick. And as I recall, they actually downgraded the bond rating back in that, I think Ray, was it was McKenna and Ray Fernet and those guys who were in power. Um, <clears throat> the government had had on its books, or on its, in its files for years and years and years, the recommendation to regionalize the healthcare system. That had been done in many, many other countries and there had been reports in this province going back 40 years before that re re recommending that strategy. But McKenna was smart enough to know that it was a political hornet's nest to, to do that. And so, but armed with the threats from New York, Wall Street, wherever the bond rating agencies mm -hmm. reside, he, and armed with no opposition in the legislature, he was able in 1992 to do what no, no other premier dared to do before or since. Um, and so, to me, we're right back to where we were in 1990. The bond rating agencies already have sounded warnings in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there will be more warnings, I'm convinced of it. And then maybe we'll get action uh, on important things like this that will help us to create a planned approach to our future as opposed to an ad hoc approach. To add um, maybe a bit of a paradigm shift to this conversation about provinces' finances, a past guest on the show, Keith Helmuth, um, went into wonderful depth about the notion of public banking. Has that yes. crossed your guys' path at all? Because, and I won't do Keith justice, so people watch what he does because it's wonderful. He teaches us step by step to that point, and then it needs more study and more depth. But it seems like there's something to this notion because Canada, once upon a time, got itself out of a tough situation by using public banking. And some of the wheels started to come off when it switched in the 70s to the private model because of globalization and global economy pressures. Absolutely, no question. And one of our guys in the group, Les Smith, has done ex extensive research in this. As a matter of fact, we only met yesterday. And there is a possibility that we could set up a bank of New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we did, and if the, and if the federal government went along, we could borrow money uh, from um, the uh, central bank uh, at the same rate that the federal government borrows. And so their, their uh, lending rate today is 1.25. <laughs> uh, and, and earlier you talked about the difference one percent makes. Yeah, and so we're probably averaging four points uh, with uh, if we're paying seven hundred thousand and twenty <clears throat> billion. Uh, so yeah, we're probably paying about four percent. Um, so you, now, mind you, we have a sinking fund that is there for contingency of you know that's in the four or five billion. But uh, we talked about it at length yesterday and. Uh, kind of left it open-ended, but if that were to occur, it would be a huge boost. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is to convince the federal government if they do it for us, do they, are they obligated to do it for other provinces? Uh, but if somehow we could convince uh, the feds that this is a good thing. But if I were a fed minister or senior bureaucrat and someone like us came to me and I'd say, okay, we want to do this. They say their reaction is going to be, what are you doing to solve your problems? Yeah. You got all these hospitals, 18 or 20 hospitals, you got this, 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 and they'd have their, they'd, no question, they'd have their homework done. So if we expect to get some help, we, we got to take ownership. Of, of our situation, absolutely, which yeah. is what we're, we're all about. And that speaks to another theme that would be a sign of a shift, is that we just get on with it. We have the resources and tools yes. To, yes. A, to a majority degree to go fix our own problems. Yes, yeah. yes. So there's a culture shift, because um, there's been a few generations now where part of the pattern of the narrative is that, oh, a government will fix that for me. So yeah. in, we've been talking a lot about money. There's a certain number of things we could fix that doesn't don't even doesn't involve money. It just yeah. involves a better interaction and relationship. And oh. it's a psychological thing. Sorry, Ken, yeah. but it's a psychological <laughs> thing. Somewhere along the line, say 1950, 60, or whatever, we have grown so dependent on government hmm. at all levels. You know that we think that we can go to government and they can fix everything. And. To give it a bit of historical context, some of that might be from the Equal Opportunities Act in 66, where an awful lot of those responsibilities were put into the yeah. legislature because municipalities didn't have the resources. Right. But in 2018, you know, there's a different scenario at play. The social media alone, um, large-scale databases, data mining, uh, that alone allows yeah. for a lot of localized decision-making with evidence-based yeah. in flow in time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And certainly in, in the arena that I that I know best, I re, re, I'm repeating my, myself over and over. I don't believe we need a whole heck of a lot of new financial resource. What we need is leadership and, and courage, um, because making the kinds of decisions that are required on in in any of these areas for survival, for our systems improvement. It's tough stuff. I learned that the hard way back in the 90s. But it's worth doing. It is absolutely worth doing because when you get down downstream from your decision, you see a whole better set of relationships, a few casualties along the way perhaps. But, um, and, and we certainly saw that with regionalization. Um, 
Do you have any, sorry, but oh. do you have an example? Uh, do you have one, man, if we would just do this, then this would happen over here and, and make that part of the narrative for this election? Well, right here in Fredericton. Um, one of the first things we did, Tom Peters, who was the, then chief of surgery, he and I got on a plane and went to, to look at one of the most successful health systems in uh, in uh, in the U.S., the Sutter system in the southwestern U.S., and in particular, at that up till that point, we had had huge issues in surgical cancellations within the Chalmers, and um, and just down the road, a mere 15 minutes, you had the Ormacta Public Hospital that was really feeling pretty threatened with regionalization, as they should have. And we came back with a dream and a vision for day surgery, which we, uh, so we went to our market and said, how about this? Um, they loved it. We implemented a day surgical program in our Mocto, <clears throat> which took off an awful lot of the, the um, short stay, no stay day surgical operations out of the Chalmers, took all that traffic and put it into a uh, facility that specialized just in just in that. Uh, people have been raving about that ever since. The doctors at first didn't like it, but the doctors now love it uh, when you talk to them. So that's that's just one of many. Hmm. Yeah. I think instinctively uh, the Brunswicker knows there's something wrong. Deep down within themselves. I don't think it's going to take a lot to change the, the mindset. I think they know. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, if the leadership can be provided, then I think they will buy into it, so, even though it may be tough, but they don't. Okay. In your world as you do this, does the issue of food and farming, food security, does that come up at all? It could, you know, past guests, past interviews, it could be a main economic driver for us again. Yeah, <clears throat> it could very well be. Uh, we haven't discussed it. Uh, you know, all we've said is that a lot of the... You know the uh, development has occurred in the IT industry in the in the province, and that's good. I mean, we got uh, a new one coming in Fredericton here, which is great. Yep. And uh, and so uh, absolutely, uh, th that could be a source. I mean, the issue of frack fracking, you know, is another issue, and it's a sensitive political issue, and not everybody's for it and this type of thing. But I tell you, it's a resource, and it's a resource that other people are ex exploring. And so you got to build in safety nets for all that stuff, but it's part of the economic development. So if we could get to agro and other things like that, then yeah, anything that's going to generate some employment and opportunities it should be looked at. Okay. So let's poke into another theme, um, more of the human behavior theme. Um, it's an election time. People get out to vote, supposedly. The last election, 198,000 eligible New Brunswickers chose not to vote. Um, how do we get them engaged? Would this be a way to get them engaged, where the coalitions start to surface, citizen engagement improves? They make that leap thinking, okay, we'll put our feet in this one more time in the hopes that a politician will listen and will actually turn into an action. Because we sit on that cusp, you know, 200,000 people roughly just don't engage to say, what's the point? Which is part of how we've gotten in this mess. Yeah. So how do exactly. we encourage them to know, no, no, you need you need to get off the sidelines and get in on this. We, and, and we need them to ask the politicians and the people that are running for office, you know, I mean, the tough questions. You know, no longer can can this be a self-serving office. It, it the, the people that are running have got to have a sincere desire for the problems of New Brunswick to help to facilitate change, mm -hmm. and and the people need to get engaged and they need to ask them the tough questions. And my I sum it up: so Does the office seek the person, or does the person seek the office? Mm -hmm. And and it's so often is that the person seeks the office that maybe aren't that shouldn't seek the office. And I'm I'm not, you know I'm not criticizing; it's just reality. Uh, but somehow, if we could turn that around and ch and try to attract the right people, mm -hmm. you know, and for for me, doing what we're doing from the outside in could be more effective than being from the inside out. Yes, you yeah. know, and I think Ken yeah. feels the same way. Sure. Uh, and so, if we have the people behind us, uh, then we can make a difference. But that's what they have to do. Mm -hmm. They got to challenge the people. Okay, what are you going to do to solve the situation to make it a better province? Tell me. Yeah, I see that on Facebook all the time, that, <clears throat> that what's the use mentality, uh, the cynicism of governmental political promises, 
uh, election promises, um, the way various perceived crises are, are managed, handled, publicized. Um, so, so in a presentation I was giving yesterday, yesterday that very question was raised, so what can we do? And um, I think we're way beyond the days of parading on King Street and things of that nature. But what you can do is use social media. What you can do is when elected, when polit politicians aspiring for election come to seek your vote, you can ask them some tough questions like, how are we going to deal with this mess in health care? Mm -hmm. And if you get the glib responses of, oh, we're going to put another 60 beds or we're going to whatever, don't buy that. Don't buy that. It's got to be a transformation uh, yeah. in yeah. the response. Do you feel like we're comfortable in following your theme? We've tried the same solutions now for 40 some odd years to some of these complex problems. Absolutely. And they keep offering them back as the solution. Yeah. Times are changing. I mean, we can't offer the same solutions. I mean, we got immigrations, we got issues, we got labor issues, and we got demographics of people getting older. Yeah, it's not the same issues. They're not, you know, we got to, we got to, you know, we're all dressed up and nowhere to go. Yeah, <laughs> basically, and and so we, that's what we have to do. I mean, it's no point in saying we're going to build a thousand nursing home beds when we can't find people to work in nursing homes now. Yep. So where are we going to get the people? Yeah. You know, so this is where it has to be co co coordinated. You, you know that, that you can't separate. You can't have one department separate from the other, and they got to talk. They have to talk, and right now some departments aren't talking to one another, hmm. you know, which, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, but that's what's happening. Part of what uh, how you're describing this makes me think of a book by a guy named Joe Trippi called "The Revolution Will Not Be Televised." written about 10 or 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and buried in the book amongst a thousand other things. He was a presidential candidate manager type, <clears throat> and was responsible for Howard Dean's campaign uh, 15, 16 years ago before Dean had his meltdown on YouTube and, and yep. everything went south. But he talked about the collective brain power, knowledge, and heart of the large-scale group because social media lets that come together. And maybe time to have large scale gatherings again where the community comes together and creates the agenda, creates the moment, creates the solution. Because he really believed that the solution was out there. Yes. Rather than we're appointing you, you fix it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a, a major shift yeah. in thinking. And New Brunswick's, you know, a certain size. We have access to each other. We have. Um, and there's a rep there's a huge repertoire of good quality <coughs> people who are retired deputy. We have a few deputy ministers in, in in our group, eh? And then we have the university people and the and the university students. We could we could we could engage the students to help us research, and and do some work. And they they in turn would benefit from doing it and so forth. So it's that synergy that we have the people yeah. to help us. Yeah, that's obvious from doing all these shows. The talent in this province is yeah. unbelievable. Yes, it is. Um, we just yeah. don't know. We don't tell ourselves our stories. Yeah. There's a gap. There's a, <laughs> I've seen that gap over and over and over, and over particularly in the last few years. Um, the politicians feel like they own a problem, whatever that problem may be. They default to the civil servants, and these are wonderful people that... They don't take anything away, but that somewhere, somewhere, the actual resolution of whatever problem um, falls between the cracks. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. There's a there's a gap there. I, I think I'm get, beginning to understand it. And mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is is certainly uh, it's one of the ways out of it. Just absolutely. like some some of our economic growth um, <coughs> can be the young people. So Richard Florida's book, The Creative Class, talks about the shifts in the values for the millennials and why they work. Yeah. And they work for quality of life. They don't work for the job and their career path. Mm -hmm. You make New Brunswick a fun place to live. All the rest of it sort of takes care of itself. Yes. Yep. If, if that kind of makes sense. But how do we get that narrative into today's conversation for the election to, by including young people? They will just, like uh, the young people, shouldn't say they're in their 30s, but they've been on the show. It's phenomenal to listen to the skill sets, the, the speed, <laughs> um, the solutions that they have for stuff, but no access to authority. No, no, yeah. I can go this far, but I can't go yeah. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and make the place a, a fun, juicy place to live. We've got to make leadership and culture an absolute, absolute priority. 
Mm-hmm. Jim Senegal, who created uh, Costco out of nothing. Mm-hmm. That's his, his, that's been his main mantra from the day he, he started. Eh? He says, culture is, culture is not the most important thing. It's the only thing. Mm-hmm. And, it's uh, how we interact here. And it just applies to so many areas of our when, when you're eating an elephant, you can only do it one piece at a time. We we tend to be over overwhelmed yes. with everything. Yeah. You know, and you can't. You gotta prioritize. Yeah, exactly. And right now the priority in the province of New Brunswick is this we gotta deal with this health and long term care because the numbers are there. Mm-hmm. And if we don't, you know, you, you can see the level of services starting to decline decline in the hospitals. And and so you you're gonna see it. You, you see it now. You see I was up uh, visiting a friend and we got a hip operation and there was a I think Three of the other people in that ward were seniors, hmm. and one one was there since September waiting to get into a nursing home. If we don't deal with it, yep. this is what's going to happen. Yep. So let's tie that to what a solution would be, because another past guest, thanks to your referral, was Karen Lake, talking about there's an opportunity to hire three thousand people, roughly, to do in-home care services. Yes, which helps offset that issue, yes. which ties to your bailiwick, where yep. you know healthcare. Sure. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, there's a solution laid out between a conversation with three different people. There is the solution. So yes. how does it turn into an action? And it's one small tick in their practical application of a solution to yep. create employment, keep people at home longer. Um, that helps hospital systems. It's all stuff that Karen mapped out. Great. Yep. Similarly for Pat McCarthy, from a CEO from Recycle New Brunswick. He sees a huge opportunity for a recycling facility to a certain scale mm-hmm. in the Sussex area. If the three cities would learn to cooperate and build that, then you have access to ports for shipping some of your product. You yep. can't make it. It's not sexy. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, and yet there's a chance for 300 to 400 full-time, uh, long-term jobs. Yeah. So there's 3,400 yeah. jobs. Okay. Put in public banking. Um, bring back public auto insurance with all that work that was done back then and, and how yeah. that would work to benefit. The pro- Can we let go of the old ways of doing things to integrate some of these solutions? Well, it's 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 tough. Uh, you know, we all take the, the issue for me has always been there's always a great deal uh, of comfort in staying in your own world. When you when you step outside your comfort zone and and try to be comfortable with change, it's scary for many people. Mm-hmm. I've lived my entire life mostly living on the edge, and I find it kind of exhilarating in a way. But that's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean. People like to have a check every two weeks, and you know that's that's just typical. And so it's it's uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but again, you know, um, have you been talking to senior civil servants and getting their perspective of? No, Tim. My hope is to get a group of them on and to talk about what it's like for them working in the civil service during an election period because there's an impact on their work life when an election's on. And yes. uh, and that's one of those shadow discussions that it would be fun to bring to the surface a little bit. I, I did that once. <laughs> did not enjoy it when I was in the civil service. Oh, my. Yeah, it was not a pleasant time. But to your earlier question, with Karen Lake's idea and the, the home care, uh, we've been talking about that for 20 years. I'm sorry, for 20 years. For 10 years, the talk has been become ramped up to crisis. And we talked about it here. Um, so why doesn't it get fixed? New Brun- Nova Scotia fixed that problem. Uh, other provinces have taken the lead. What keeps us from fixing the problem? Well, a couple of things keep us from fixing the problem. First of all, the narrative has to change from it's just just another cost burden because every time the discussion goes to oh you got to pay them not thirteen dollars but you got to pay them twenty bucks an hour living wage um, and then the civil servants who are bound to manage their budgets say oh, don't have any money there's no budget line for that and the politicians uh, get all wired up about it as well and. Mm-hmm. So the topic goes off the table until the next crisis. Um, what I was hoping 
with this plan was that we would take the some of the best brains of the civil service and some of the best brains of other sectors and sit around a table and create a proper plan. Uh, just throwing money at it, just improve, increasing the the wage rate for these people, that's that will just go to your bottom line mm -hmm. and and increase the red ink. Mm -hmm. But there's a way of doing it in an orderly fashion with a good coherent plan region by region in this province and uh, that's the discussion that never happens at least and, not the and, and the other group that that needs to address <coughs> social responsibility not all but many unions hmm. i mean th they need to come to the table for a discussion as well and uh, we haven't had that discussion yet but we will Good, because once upon a time, um, unions used to be adaptable, creative. They're the ones who will still claim the legacy of the weekend and maternity leave yes. and those changes. Yes. Something has changed drastically in unions yes. since the 80s, and it's entrenched, it's rigid, um, it's not based on merit or performance, it's based on um, seniority. Uh, so that's a system that needs to tweak. But the hope for unions is once upon a time they were the ones that were the creative beasts they said here's a social change here's a policy change that needs to happen yep. but it has to get into that cooperative mindset rather yes. than that yep. competitive mindset you know and and the other thing is, is that must be done is that you know you 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 need to do a vision and you need to have 20 years or 25 years out now i'll give you an example like the the bulge that we're experiencing now the baby boom bulge will start to decline Yep. As, as time goes on. So we have to look at, at nursing homes and the type of construction. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a developer, and, and I bid a nursing home with Ken help there in terms of the operations. And I bid for a nursing home because I had the land, and I didn't qualify. But the, what I was uh, abhor abhorred about was the cost of the development based on the, the specs that were provided. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm say, saying, wait now, this, this doesn't need to be this way yeah. you know there's a, this curve and you got to plan for the curve yes and so your decisions today for future has to reflect that I can remember 10 or 15 years ago the idea that population statistics and demographics should drive you know a major portion of your long-term planning yes. because you know it's coming and you can predict within a certain range 80% of it about they're going to need this here they're going to need this here you yeah. know um, we're getting near the end, but I wanted to, the notion about buildings made me think about retail. So the impacts of technology and automation into the retail world has drastically changed what that's like. Yes. And when you talk about buildings, you know, the destruction of, or the abandonment of big boxes yes. left as things shift and change. And we're not a big place. So the impact is quite significant when the big box stores pick up and go, we're done. Mm -hmm. um, that gets into that long-term planning Yes. So, yes. so that's a different mindset. So it might be that some of that business language that's focused on um, a certain return on investment in a certain window of time might not be the best language to dominate large scale social issues for, you know, government should run more like a business. Yeah. So, mm, maybe there we need a wiggle room. Well, away I think from government that. should be a, a hybrid. I'm a golfer, and so a hybrid is somewhere in, in between, you know. And so uh, <laughs> there needs to be some business principles, but not all. You know, the, the government's there to look after the people, the people that just can't look after themselves. So the government needs to protect the people. In so doing, there has to incorporate some business principles. Eh? It's, it's so that's, that's a combination that I think probably is needed and should work. I think when we say government needs to operate as a biz business, that's a, <clears throat> that's a shortcut to the topic of leadership. That's really what it's all about. And Costco was formed, formed by Jim Senegal, mm -hmm. a leader. Um, things get done or not done in government by virtue of informed leadership. And so, um, and, and when I say informed leadership, the, the, I, I am not convinced to this day that a lot of our elected officials really understand how serious the issues are within healthcare mm -hmm. alone, which is the field I like. Mm -hmm. um, 
because if they knew how serious the issues were, how could they sleep at night? Mm -hmm. How? Right. Well, the issue with for them is just, you know, if they make the changes that are necessary, can they stay in power? Yeah. I mean, if I were a politician, I'd be I'd be looking at it from both angles. Yep. There might be a window or a message to send to aspiring politicians, given we're at the front end of an election. So the shift may be, don't be in power, but be in governance. Yes. It's a different feeling when you're yep. in governance compared yep. to, I want to be in power and, and stay yes. in power. Yep. Um, the federal liberals recently got some headlines for their shift in uh, incumbents. Uh, you know, MPs get to stay in power. There's no contesting of uh, incumbent, which automatically removes the community's opportunity to have the large-scale conversation mm -hmm. for who the candidate should be this time. So the difference between wanting to be entrenched in power and wanting to take a turn. Mm -hmm. Tied to that would uh, the notion of leadership. There's this social media graphic that goes through in a wolf pack. Um, the leader is at the back of the pack. Mm. Making sure that everybody else is okay. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's my secret is just delegate. If you can, if you get the yeah. right people around you, let them lead. Yeah. Let them t take action, eh? Yeah. And the people I have, for instance, in this coalition, I'm the president, mm. but I defer to all these people who are, who are experts. Yeah. You know, and, and all I can do is just keep them with coffee and keep them fed and keep them happy. Yeah. Uh, but, but that is right. so right. It's, yeah. it's a, get yourself it's, the people around that are capable and let them do the job and just provide the motivation and the leadership that they need. Okay, maybe to start to wind this down a little bit, but sure. tie it to the election specifically, because this show will live for a while on social sure. media. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there is some talk about um, New Brunswick having the potential this time to have a minority government and have three or four or five different voices in the legislature. <clears throat> Would that be a way for the conversations in the legislature to be more inclusive or more open to change? If we segue that to Canada's most progressive windows of time for social change at the federal level was when there were minority governments and those who were hired to do the job in the House of Commons had to figure it out together because that's why you were hired to go do that job. Now you got to figure it out. Does New Brunswick have a window here for those changes that we need to do can be supported by a change in the composition of the legislature to at least get those topics and because it'll change the dynamic of the conversation Absolutely. in the ledge. Absolutely. No question. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm attracted to that. <clears throat> Having said that, um, at the end of the day, um, the, the civil service has enormous power. And, and if you want to get things done in health, social development, finance, you got to get by the civil service. And so, so long as that process, <clears throat> in addition to getting uh, a broader base of debate, whatever issues on the table, um, will allow uh, some whoever whoever is the premier to deal with some of the issues that really need to be dealt with um, within the public service, then I'm fine with that. But if that's the if all we end up with is more blather in the legislature, however good it may be, somebody's going to make the the connection to on the ground action. That's my worry. One of the recommendations we make is to take a look at the seniors of civil servants as well. I mean, it's right in our website. Uh, to making sure that the people there are qualified to do the job. And the very well may be, but I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the issue. Right. So how would you like to send us out? Final thoughts? Well, we're not, a, at least for my part, I'm, I'm, I'm not political. Um, I don't have any affinity to any party, never have, never will. Um, my thing is all about, I'm a, I'm a one-trick pony. Health and long-term care is my trick. And uh, I just believe that we are being so underserved relative to where we could be had we stuck to the plan that was uh, intended in 1992. I guess the message I'd like to deliver is that there's hope. Mm -hmm. There's hope. Yeah, we got we got to make some changes. But look, we have so many things going for us. 
If you list the strengths of New Brunswick, eh, with its natural habitat of water and fish and all the stuff that we get going, and, and the Fundy Trail and so forth, we list this all out. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity here. So what I'd like to leave New Brunswick is that, bear with us. We're going to work as hard as we can to make a change. We're going to try to motivate other people to help, but there's hope. We'll make it. Thank you, guys. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.